Thank you. Uh, I'm Bala Shidoshi uh, from Gravity Research and Development, and I will uh, talk to you about how we use the image and the textual data uh, with deep learning for session-based recommendations. So uh, first, uh, I will talk a little bit about what is session-based recommendations and why we are particularly interested in this topic. So in uh, several domains, uh, you can see a so-called permanent user court start problem. So either you have no way or no reliable way for user identification, or uh, the goals of your users change across sessions, so you have uh, disjoint uh, sessions, or the majority of your users don't return to the site. These are very uh, common problems for uh, mid to mid-high sized uh, e-commerce uh, platforms and even content sites. So what you have here is only the interactions in a given session. So every user who comes in basically is a new user uh, for your system. So that's why we're interested in item to session recommendations, where we recommend based on the previous uh, events or the previous items visited uh, in the session. Uh, there are multiple ways to abstract this uh, for a computational task. One of these is the next event prediction, where we focus on the events on the session, in the session so far, and we want to predict the next event that the user makes. In prediction time, this uh, uh, makes up the recommendations. So I know this slide is kind of intimidating, but uh, that was half the point. Uh, this is uh, previous work uh, that we uh, proposed for this uh, session-based uh, recommendation problem with recurrent neural networks. I assume that most of you are familiar with RNNs, but uh, I will talk a little bit about it uh, even then. So RNNs are special uh, type of neural networks uh, that are for processing sequential data. They have a hidden state, and uh, they update this hidden state. The next value of this hidden state depends on the previous value of the hidden state and the actual input. If you roll this network out, uh, you basically get a very, very deep network. Uh, that's why some people say that uh, RNNs are the deepest network uh, of them all. The vanilla RNN uh, has a few problems, like exploding and vanishing gradients, so there are uh, better solutions uh, in this field. Uh, one of them is LSTM, and the more modern version is the gated recurrent unit, or GRU for short. Uh, in the GRU, you don't just have a hidden state, but have a hidden state candidate. Uh, you have a reset gate, and you have a combination gate, so uh, you can compute uh, your gradients without having them explode or uh, to vanish. And you can see the uh, basic unit uh, in the top of the presentation. So what we basically did in this previous work is that we used a bunch of these units and put it in a GRU layer, and we fed it with a one-hot uncoded uh, item ID of the session. We computed scores on all of the uh, possible items, and then we compared it during training with the next item ID in the session, and that's how we uh, told the network to uh, predict the next event in the session. There were a few things that we needed to adapt to uh, in this domain, recommendations. So we did three things. I won't go into too much details about these. Uh, you can read uh, them in the paper, but I will just mention them. So we did session parallel uh, mini-batching uh, instead of in-session uh, window-based uh, mini-batches. We applied ranking loss because uh, that's more appropriate for the recommendation tasks. And in order to keep the method scalable, uh, we sampled negative items uh, on the output. Now on the other part, so this was the recurrent neural network part, and the other part uh, is the features, the item features. So if you think about uh, that the user receives recommendations and he has to decide whether he clicks or not, what is the information that he bases his uh, decision on? He has some prior knowledge, and he has his internal state, how tired is he, and uh, does he have time to view another product, for example. 
Uh, we can't really know anything about this, so we don't care about this. But the other influencing factor is the stuff they see on the screen, which is usually an image, a product image, a thumbnail, or a related image, uh, some kind of textual data, like a title, short description, or whatever, uh, item properties. And we want to include these uh, rich features uh, into the uh, recommendation. And that's basically the work we are dealing with. Uh, at this point, I won't tell you how we extract the feature vector from the image or text. I will talk about this uh, later. Let's just assume that we have a dense vector uh, that is a representation of the image of the item. And we will see how we can use it in the recurring neural network. So the naive solution is to replace the one hot encoded item ID on the input with this image feature vector. But uh, otherwise, leave the network as it was. So we uh, want to compute the next item ID and do uh, what we did before. Um, this has very bad offline accuracy in terms of recall, MRR, and uh, stuff like that. And if you look at the recommendations, they uh, make sense, but they are somewhat too general. So if you have looked on, uh, at uh, blue cars, you will get the uh, blue cars recommended to you, but uh, the brands won't be uh, considered. So it's a bunch of different types uh, of cars from a uh, varying price range. So it's a little bit too general. The next idea uh, is to use both information. So to have the item ID as a one hot encoded vector and to have the item feature vector, concatenate those and feed them into a single GRU layer. This is much better than the previous one, but here the accuracy is uh, very similar to that of the ID-only network, so where we only feed the ID uh, to the network. And this is because the ID is originally a s stronger signal on the next item ID, so the network learns to basically ignore the image features and focus on the uh, ID only. So this is not ideal for us as well. So that's why we came up with this uh, new architecture called Parallel RNN, or PRNN for short, uh, where you have several uh, subnets in your network, and each subnet focuses on a certain input type. So here one focuses on the item ID, and the other focuses uh, on the image features. These subnets uh, model the sessions uh, separately, and in the end we concatenate the hidden layers and compute the output from these two, basically, session models. Um, and that in this way, we have uh, the best of both worlds, basically. We can train this network uh, easily by backpropagating through it in one go. And what we get here is the accuracy that is slightly better than that of the ID-only network. And this was very puzzling at first, but uh, then we discovered that this is because uh, the subnets learn similar aspects of the session. So basically, a large part of the uh, model capacity is uh, wasted. We somehow have to enforce that uh, different uh, subnets learn different aspects of the model. So that's why we came up with uh, some alternative uh, training methods. Uh, to force the network to learn different aspects that complement each other. Uh, these training methods are uh, inspired by ALS and ensemble learning. And the idea is to fix, uh, to train one subnet and fix uh, all the others during that training and then alternate between them. And uh, depending on the frequency of the alternation, we came up with three different uh, methods. In residual training, to you train the first subnet all the way, then move to another, then move to another, and you won't revisit uh, the first uh, subnet ever. In alternating training, you go by epochs. So you train one, net, uh, one subnet for one epoch, uh, then the next one for one epoch, then you go back to the first one, and so on. And in interleaving training, uh, changing between the networks is really fast. So you basically train them per mini batch. So uh, basically, you train them uh, per some training examples. And now I will move on to the experiments and talk a little bit about um, how we extracted the features and what data we used and what results we got. 
So the first experiment uh, was on an online video site, much like YouTube, but not YouTube. Uh, we had like uh, 700,000 items, uh, 70 million events in 17 million sessions. So it was a quite big data set. Uh, in the test set, we had around a million events to validate for. Because of the high number of events, we uh, decided to compare the score of the actual relevant item only to the top 50K most popular uh, items in order to uh, do the evaluation faster. For featured extraction, uh, so for item features, we used uh, the images, and for featured extractions, uh, we used a pre-trained uh, Google Net as implemented in uh, Coffee that was pre-trained on the ImageNet uh, dataset. So I think that uh, pre-training is uh, crucial in this uh, scenario because uh, it would be very hard to learn the embeddings uh, and learn the session information on uh, half completed uh, embeddings in one go. So we have to do some kind of pre-training. Maybe we could, uh, or me, maybe we can use uh, other types of network to do this pre-training. And what I show here uh, with these cat pictures, that even though um, the network was trained on a different data set, it finds quite good uh, similar uh, pictures. So uh, as you can see here, we uh, found the top three uh, similar image to the image uh, on the right. And these are not just cats, but cats with uh, weird fac facial expressions. So they are very similar. Uh, for the feature vector, we used the values of the last average pooling layer, and we got a vector of uh, 1,024 uh, values, we normalized uh, it to have a length of one. And these are our results. We ran experiments with low number of hidden units that was uh, 100, uh, 100 plus 100 for the PRNN. We only have a stronger baseline that is 200 hidden units for the ID-only network. And uh, basically, we got a 15% improvement uh, over the ID-only network in terms of recall and MRR at uh, 20. Uh, or uh, we got uh, improvements 15% uh, in MRR. In recall, you uh, can see mu much improvement, but uh, this is because the original recalls, recall values were already very high. So basically what happens is that, that uh, the top 20 list contains basically the same number of relevant items, but they are pushed more to the top, which is very important in recommender systems. We also run experiments with high number of features. That was uh, 500 plus 500 for the peer and, and 1,000 uh, for the others. And what is interesting here is that um, increasing the number of hidden units further has diminishing returns and increasing the number of epochs also has uh, diminishing returns. Basically, the results won't change if I would double the number of hidden units here. But even in this setup, we could get a uh, uh, 5 to 7% increase in MRR uh, using the image features besides the ID over the ID-only network. We did another experiment uh, with text. Uh, for this, we used the, classified, uh, the data of a classified site. Here we have 3, uh, 300,000 items and uh, 9 million events. So it's a much uh, smaller data set. Unfortunately, the text for the items was multi-language and user generated. So it was very, very noisy and very hard to deal with. And this uh, influenced our featured extraction method. Basically, what worked the, the best for us is to extract uh, unigrams and bigrams and then uh, use a TF-IDF uh, uh, weighting on the top of that. Uh, this way, we got sparse vectors uh, that, were, that had more than one million values, but on average, they had like uh, five to six uh, non-zeros. We only did the experiments with the high features here, and uh, we experienced that we could achieve like a 3% uh, increase in recall and around 5% uh, increase in MRR. Okay, to, to sum it up, uh, we tried to incorporate image and text features into session-based recommendations using our previous work uh, 
the RNN, which model the sessions. The, in our experience, the naive inclusion is not effective, and the uh, concatenating is also not effective, so we came up with a new architecture, parallel RNNs. Uh, we also had to come up with uh, new training methods that uh, fit this uh, architecture. There are a few things uh, missing here, or a few things left to uh, future work. One is that we can definitely revisit the feature extractions. So in this work, we didn't really focus uh, on this uh, much, and it would be interesting to try different techniques like uh, ResNets for the image, or even training some generative adversarial networks on our own thumbnail data and get some kind of uh, representation uh, for our images that is learned in an unsupervised fashion. We can also try to do representations uh, for, try to compute representations for the whole video and see how this affects uh, recommendations. Here, an interesting question is that the user doesn't see the whole video before clicking on it, so how it influences the click and the clicks is uh, up to question. And we could also use multiple aspects for an item, so uh, we could use image and text in uh, parallel. So, thank you. Thanks, Balas. I have a couple of questions uh, on the data set, on the video data set. Uh, which type of events uh, um, uh, were present in the data set? Click events or uh, so, vi the, the view of the video? So, in the video data set, uh, we use the watched event that is defined as the user starts watching the video and watches at least uh, a number of seconds or a uh, proportion of the video, like 30%. And, okay, thanks. And, and the goal of the prediction is to predict the next watched video or any video in the, in the session? That, uh, uh, basically, the next uh, video is the criteria during learning. Okay. Are there uh, other questions? One here. Uh, I have oh. a question. Thanks for the talk. You said that it would not be beneficial to train the feature extraction and the session information in one model. And how do you know this? How can you tell that this doesn't work out? So, uh, er so earlier we experimented with embeddings for the item IDs as well. And we experienced that if you train them in one go, the representations for the item ID is, so the embeddings are not complete. And you try to model the session on incomplete representation, uh, which uh, puts you in an unoptimal uh, point. And uh, that's why I think that pre-training is crucial in this setup. So uh, when you start to learn these embeddings, you start from a random. So for the first few steps, your session model based, is based on random uh, embeddings. And, uh, and yeah, so then the session uh, models uh, go astray, and then uh, this has an effect on the uh, embeddings as well. So I don't think it's worth it. So pre-training is... Uh, it's better for this task, in my opinion. So there, oh. yeah. um, Have you looked at why some of the training methods is better than another? Also, have you looked at when you do training on a complementary network, for example, train the features, complements the ID, what kind of thing you are learning on the feature side? For example, if you have an embedding layer, what you are learning there? And so in detail, we didn't look at the embedding layer and what uh, do we learn there because it was uh, mostly pre-computed. And uh, as for what features uh, complement the uh, item IDs uh, the most, uh, uh, because we only worked with one item feature uh, in one experiment, so either the image, either the text, uh, we don't really know, so it's definitely up to future work. Uh, uh, there is a question here. Great talk, first of all. It's on, it's on. It works. Is it on? Yeah, okay. Um, you said that for the input, if you concatenate both the item ID and the feature, the content 
the model learns to ignore the content and the model is overtaken by the, by the item ID. Therefore, you suggest the new architecture that uses two uh, RNNs. So could you give the intuition why in this architecture the model doesn't learn to ignore one of the RNNs and to use the, only the other one? So I think that both RNNs are forced uh, to model the session in some way because the hidden states are uh, separate in this case. So they have to uh, create a session models. But uh, in some way, this dominance of one of the network over the others also happens uh, if you do the training in one go, so in a back propagation over the whole architecture. And that's why I think that you, that's another reason why you need this alternating training. Thank you. So, uh, other questions? Okay, so thanks again, the speaker, for the presentation. Uh, thank you for attending the session and enjoy your lunch.